Welcome to Build with Rob. I am Rob Deerdeck, CEO and founder of the Deerdeck Machine, a one of a kind venture creation studio. We are a company that creates companies by systematically fusing art, science, and magic through a process we call the machine method. The art is the creative vision and constant shaping and refinement of an idea. The science is the proven methods and time tested fundamentals of business. The magic is the intangible, universal luck that provides provides an unexplainable push towards success. Each guest on this show is one of my do or dire partners and co-founders. This show is an inside look at all the companies that we create and the lessons that we have learned along our journey. Our guest today, the one and only Christopher R. King, co-founder and CEO of 333, the world's finest bespoke luxury goods brand. Chris uh, is a wholly unique talent, a true gentleman with attention to detail that I have never seen before. His desire to create the very best products created a lot of push and pull while we were developing this brand together. You know, I really wanted to build and scale a huge luxury brand, and he really wanted to stay hyper-focused on quality, sourcing the best materials, and being a true artist. It was when he began creating these one-of-a-kind functional works of art for some huge celebrities that it was clear where we had to evolve the business model. Developing the right business model that allowed aligns with your core values is essential to the long-term sustainability of any business. Christopher R. King, welcome to the Build with Rob show. So good to be here, brother. I, I mean, let's start first with the simple fact, okay? Mm. We are partners in this great luxury brand, 333, but our journey actually started in this penthouse in Beverly Hills that we sit and shoot this show right now. <laughs> what people listening might find fascinating is we are shooting this podcast from where this man worked for many, many years. This is actually his office yeah. that you worked in. It has now been turned into the bit. Think about that. Your office that you worked from for years is now where you're shooting a podcast like six years later. <laughs> and now it's your office. Right. <laughs> Let's talk about our journey, right? Because I'd like to give listeners sort of the backstory to the destiny side of how we became partners. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I... It had moved out of downtown, right? It was getting my house in Mulholland Estates in Beverly Hills and wanted an office here really bad. But I had a specific request in my mind. I needed a penthouse. Mm -hmm. And so I searched and searched and I had the LoopNet app and I searched and I searched. And on July 3rd yeah. of 2016, I looked down on the app and there was this <laughs> penthouse yeah. in Beverly Hills. And I'm, I didn't, I wasn't searching the app. I searched it over and over and over and over again. And there were no penthouses here. But for some reason, my phone was open. It was on the LoopNet app and there was the picture of the building. This yeah. is how deep I was. I picked it up. I took it straight to my wife and said, I just manifested this. <laughs> Look at this. It just showed up here. I just manifested this. So what did I do? I immediately call. I immediately call the broker. It is Sunday, July 3rd. I remember. And so I, of course, you know, I'm trying to use the power of the Rob Deerdeck name, right? And, and it's hit or miss. It's hit or miss, right? Like, you know, you got this MTV celebrity. You got this vibe cooking. Like you say, hey, this is Rob Deerdeck. Huh? Huh? Anything? Anything? Yeah, yeah. Right? You just hope to catch somebody with it. And lo and behold, did I get a call back from leaving that message in five minutes? Mm -hmm. uh, and the broker was like, hey, oh, hey, Rob, great, great to connect with you. Yeah, I'd love to show it to you. That'd be great. I could show it to you on Tuesday. It's Sunday and uh, July 3rd and tomorrow's July 4th on Monday. So I can show it to you on Tuesday. I said, no, 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 no. You, I get it. I get it. Totally get it. Let's connect on Tuesday. Told the wife. Get dressed. <laughs> Let's go see this thing. That was, I had a conversation with that man at 10 a.m. I drove straight down the hill, mm -hmm. straight to this office, pulled right in front, jumped out. And right as I jumped out at around, you know, call it 1020, mm -hmm. right? 20 minutes later, there was a man on Sunday, July 3rd, walking out of the building as I pulled up. And I said, hey, hey, sir, sir, excuse me, where are you coming from? He said, what? Uh, what? 
I said, where are you coming from? He's like, I'm the penthouse. I'm like, can you take me up there? <laughs> and he was like, um, uh, okay. Right. And, and I'll, and I'll let you fill in the blanks of who he was. But so I go up there and I shoot a photo of myself in the conference room and text it to the broker half hour after saying, I'll go see it on Tuesday. And I just said, I'll take it. Right. So he's like, what? Like how, what? And so it turns out this is when I first hear the name Mr. King, yeah. because the gentleman said to me, hey, I, if you give me your contact, I could g give it to Mr. King. And, and you'll find it funny. He only called you Mr. King. <laughs> right. So it was like so it's like even to set the bar of us meeting, it was still like this insane penthouse in Beverly Hills, right? It's Mr. King, right? It's, I must connect you with Mr. King if you must. If you want to if you want to speak of this penthouse in Beverly Hills, you must. You must speak with Mr. King. So I say, yeah, here, here's my number. Um, because he told me it was rented, right? And so I text back to the broker on Sunday, July 3rd, what's up? This thing's rented? And he texts me like, oh, don't even worry about that. Don't even worry about that. I can, I can, I can make that deal go away. So now I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. Then out of nowhere, I get the call from Christopher R. King. And it's like, hey, man, how you doing? You know, and it's like, it's like, you know, because think about it now. Um, Attempting to, to, to get this extraordinary piece of property in Beverly Hills, California from a man named Mr. King. <laughs> and like when you call, I'm already trying to envision you in my mind, you know what I mean? Of like, what could this guy be? And then you immediately laid out with the most interesting story of our fates, which was what? How Well, first you text me, you got my number from the guy and text me a picture of you sitting in the conference room. Oh, I did that to you. Oh, I yeah, did that you did to that you to too. me as well. <laughs> And I'm like, oh my God, this is so, this is my guy. But what's crazy is it was just months prior that we passed each other at the Amman Resorts in Turks and Caicos. This is what I'm saying. So, so you informed me of, hey, this is crazy. Yeah. We stayed at the same hotel yeah. in Turks and Caicos. And to give you the context of this hotel, there was me... Christopher R. King that was not my friend that I didn't know and like five other people. Right. So me and Chris King were on this like passing each other all day at a yeah. resort, never yeah. said anything to each other, yeah. only to exchange a text to ultimately meet for the first time about me coming in and, and leasing this penthouse. Now, here, here goes the next stage of this story. He says to me, hey, I tell you what. Let's meet up. I, I got a deal on the table, but it's not done yet. Mm -hmm. uh, let's meet up and talk about it. So we now meet. I'm out front of this building waiting for Mr. King. <laughs> you know, already trying to like, what's the vibe of like a Mr. King that was at this resort that I was in in Turks and Caicos and, and he's called Mr. King. And man, the first impression was the most like insane like experience ever. So our entire like journey, it had literally kicked off the way that you would want two people that came together to create a brand like this, mm -hmm. because this guy pulled up in a convertible white drop head <laughs> Rolls Royce top down. I'm like, oh, here, this guy, <laughs> he had these crazy blue glasses matching this like insane, like he was dressed to the night, like little handkerchief hanging out. His, you know, his beautiful girlfriend steps out of the other side. He's just, you know, I, you know, he's just blade. I mean, I probably smelled him from a block away, <laughs> you know, some insane, like, like, you know, I don't even know what the cologne was. He just waffed up on me. I got caught in a cloud of wealth and like just elegance right on the spot. It's very representative of who you are because you are this extraordinary gentleman, uh, but also come from like a background of growing up similar to how I came up. So it could have gone either way. It would have been like, hello, what, what is you? What are you? Like some sort of, you're a skate star? Yeah. Like, but instead it was like, what's up? It was like. That would be my accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead, it was like this immediate kindred. I, uh, because I had, you know, I had my street luxury, my Ferrari and my wife. How you but doing? it was what dope because it was yeah. the, the, the white Ferrari and then the white rolls and this like this. 
Right. You know, it was it was uh, it, it was pretty crazy. It was an instant bro at first sight. Yeah, you know what I mean? It sure. was like, sure. and then we got to going. We just got to going. It yeah. just you know, it's two characters now, kind of showing out and and being like, you know, it's this and this would be perfect for you know. <laughs> so I had this, I, and so it immediately starts with how you begin to explain how you built it in the details of what you did when you designed this place, right? But I also think it's, you know, looking back and hearing you share the story, we haven't shared this in a while, is something didn't sit well with the with the person who wanted it before. Like there yeah. was this gut feeling that it wasn't right and I didn't know what it was. And then here you show up on a Sunday and it was like, I mean, this is the guy that 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 should have it. This is the guy that, you know, and and so it was kind of like, and I think that crossing... Uh, pass earlier in Turks and Caicos was just kind of like a sign like, okay, this is, this is the guy. Yeah. This and think about it. If I don't look down and see that on the app, it's rented the been. next day. Yeah. Right. If yeah. I don't like just have that, that like, let's go yeah. take a look at it. Yeah. Like, I just want to go take a look at it. And, yeah. and I landed here at, at the exact time to yeah. see the gentleman coming out, who yeah. uh, incidentally ended up being like someone that worked for you, that was that was he was moving he was moving our stuff. Yeah, yeah. so it's like, it, I mean, the the thinnest of margin mm -hmm. for this entire story, ultimately to this podcast to ever even happen, right? We hung out like we yeah. were hanging out a lot quickly. It was right. like this, just right. So it was like, let's go get a dinner, and that's when I got I discovered the King's Way, <laughs> right, and. It was, you know, it was unlike anything I had experienced. So, so again, now every step of the way with you has been this experience, mm. right? And spa goes, you know, where it's like, Mr. King, we have, you know, he has special table in the corner. <laughs> it's like, I mean, every step of the way from like his caviar to the way his truffle goes on his butter. I don't know. It was so many. That was the first time you had caviar. It was right? the first time I had caviar. It was like, no, 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 no. Get him the A5 Wagyu. <laughs> the A5 Wagyu. And again, it's like, what? We're, what's A5? Oh, it's, you know, like every detail of everything that he ordered, he was sharing with me. And, and from why the wine was the way it was and where it came from and the hills that the grapes were grown on. And, and just this furthering, furthering detail that led to the king's way experience, you know, and up until that point, we still hadn't fully crossed any real boundary of where a business opportunity was. It was really like, hey, let's meet up later and discuss if there's some place for us to to connect on on sort of business. So what was what was sort of your take when we were going into that first meeting where it was like, hey, let's explore if there's opportunity for us. What What was on your mind in that first meeting we had? You know, we obviously connected and there was just a friendship from the start, you know, and I think we just, if I look back and remember like the Spagos and the Bel Air and, you know, the places that we went, it was always laughing. It was always cracking jokes. I mean, it was literally like we grew up together. I mean, yeah. that's how I, that's how I kind of really remember it. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where I think there was a point where I was like, man, like, I mean, if we're having this much fun together. I mean, there's got to be something we can do together. You know, I think you and I are both these, you know, entrepreneurial spirits where it's like, what's the opportunity? You know, I, I don't know. You know, this guy was, you know, he's a big TV star and he was skateboarding. And I mean, you know, there's got to be something. And so I think it was just the having the openness to figure out and start a conversation like, what can we do? Because if we're having this much fun together at dinners and, and hanging out, you know, I'm sure we would have the same kind of fun and energy doing a business together, I think was my, my thought process. Yeah. And look, and so that meeting sort of turned into a general exploratory meeting mm. that then said, let me explain to you, um, you know, cause again, even up to that point, you showed up again mm. with some crazy, you were explaining me your briefcase. It was like this, <laughs> you know, double riveted, like you were explaining yeah. the depth of like yeah. the, you know, what, where this briefcase had even come from and the construction of it mm -hmm. just to start the meeting. And this same sort of story kept happening over and over where I kept being so 
enthralled with all of this detailed information that you had about what were seemingly just nice things, Mm -hmm. right? Like no, like in the way that you would explain your watch and who made it and what it was and why the name I'd never even heard of, like a (laughs) Gerbello, like a, you know, whatever, you know, all of these different, you know, the Vicuna, like on the end, like every, it was, I was every bit of, it was not from this place of, hey, this is, you know, I'm wealthy and this is me showing it off, like, and my wealth as much as it was craftsmanship and the detail and all this. And it made, like, these luxury, seemingly just luxury items super interesting. Mm -hmm. So my brain starts spinning and and I lay out how I built... Yeah, the, the fantasy factory, the, right? The so, in in my entire career that I integrated media mm-hmm. and skateboarding into it, and I said, "Hey, I, this is how I built uh, the fantasy factory," and then had Street League and Street Dreams and Wild Grinders and my Skate Plaza Foundation, and then I had all my endorsement deals with DC and Monster and all this stuff, and that I had built this fully integrated multi-platform universe of brands and media. Mm-hmm. And then I moved a circle over to the right and I said, and now I'm doing it with just business. Mm -hmm. And to me, you need to do the luxury version of this. I remember. Right. And still have the picture of that. Right. Like it was because to me, I'm like, you are the brand. You are the brand. Like in the day and age where it's like, let the founder and the visionary, like you could do, you are the next LVMH, like, like become the brand completely. But to that point, you had never even really been Ever. like so crazy. Yeah. And what, why not? And then what was it like to make, to begin to make that transition to commit to being the brand? Well, I think, I mean, you know, I remember you laying it out in the whiteboard and then, you kind of erased that and then, and then drew what it would look like for me and, you know, kind of growing up and, and, and going through life, you know, you always want to do something that you're passionate about, but then also be able to be profitable, make money at it. And so I think I just was always kind of doing businesses at the time that, you know, when it, whether it was real estate because it was hot then. And so I was always kind of, I don't want to use the word chasing a check. Cause there was some, you know, I had some, some clarity on certain things, but it was never like, I'm going to do what I really want to do. And I'm going to figure out how to make a business out of it. I never really dove that deep. And so I remember the first meeting where you drew that out and it kind of hit me really. I mean, I remember going home that night, not really being able to sleep, like thinking you were crazy. Like, I I mean, this is, I I don't know how this is going to work. Like, you know, and I couldn't sleep. And then I remember we said, let's follow up a couple of days later. And, and then you dove it in again and just went even deeper. And, and I, you know, because your, your first brand at the time, you, you also had the archetype, you had King of Club, right? right. So, so, and that really for me, and, and I'll let you explain King of Clubs, but that was like, if you made King of Clubs happen, Mm. then you could do that in all different types of places, right? Like, because it, it kind of give a backstory to what King of Clubs was yeah. because even creating King of Clubs yeah. is an extraordinary story unto itself. Yeah, I mean, well, it started off where I get a call from Justin Anthony, who you met, you know. And, and Justin Anthony is Justin the, Anthony's uh, a big restaurant here. He yeah. owns um, uh, a lot of restaurants in Atlanta. We became dear friends to this. I mean, we saw him, you know, we went on that Napa trip together and just been great, great friends. And he called me up one day Cause we were always trying to, I always was fascinated with the restaurant business, not really because of the profitability, but just because it was a great networking opportunity. And Justin just knew everybody around the world, which is, he knew Rob and Davi Jr. And so he calls me up. And for and context, says, Rob, Rob, Rob and Davi Mon- Jr. is the um, grandson of, or the great grandson of the original Mandavi wines, Rob and Davi that created Mandavi Estates. And then it became uh, like, I think it, um, don't quote me on the year, but I know like in the 60, late 60s, they had Charles Krug, then it became Robert Mandavi. And then they ended up creating uh, a wine together that everyone's familiar with called Opus One with Rothschild and created the first kind of like Bordeaux style blend. Yeah. Um, and so Justin calls me up and is like, hey, I think I have an opportunity for us to do something together. It's in Napa though can you come up and take a look at this building? So there was a real estate play, which I love real estate. And 
Uh, Rob was going to use one of the part of the building as office space in a tasting room. And Justin was like, we can do a little restaurant. And like, this is our first kind of get our feet wet together. Sure. When do you, when do you need to, uh, when do you need me there tomorrow? You know? So it's this King speed, like I'm there, I'll pick you up at the airport. And so, you know, again, I, I went into this meeting in Napa with this whole perception that we're going to buy this building and we're going to try to do something together. And it ended up just, we're drinking and drinking and drinking wine at, uh, I believe it was Bottega across the street from the French Laundry. And I'm ordering all this French and Italian wine because nothing on the menu was, there were no 80s and 90s, and, and, you know, Napa cabs on the, on the menu. And Justin's kind of like nudging me like, hey, we're with Rob. You should probably order something from Napa. And, you know, it just kind of evolved from there. We're all kind of drinking and, 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 and laughing and sharing dinner and the conversation steered towards wine. And, you know, why are you ordering all these old French and Italian wines and, and the difference in the style? And, um, and then it kind of just started as like, uh, you know, Rob, if you could make like wine from the left side of the menu, where we weren't really focused on price point, we just really made the best of the best, like sought the best grapes and the best barrels and created something that was really unique, you know, almost kind of like what probably your great grandfather did would, um, would you be open to something like that? And that's kind of how the whole conversation started. And then, uh, Justin was like, but, but even from that point, this is, you don't have any outside of learning about wines <laughs> and understanding wines. You're not, you're not yeah. in the, the wine business. And again, this is that true do or die or unwavering self-belief and, and relentlessness that says, Hey, you want to know what? I could talk wine with one of the most famous wine makers in the world and convince him that we could go and make <laughs> a, an extraordinary $800 bottle of, wa- yeah, yeah. of wine. Right. It, so, it like, sounds pretty cool when you say it like that. Right. I mean, that's actually like, you know, like that's what happened. Happen. Yeah, like, and, and to me, even the way you presented King of Clubs, right? Yeah. It was limited edition. Like, mm-hmm. you had to sign up and get on a, on a list if you even wanted it. Like, you would do tastings for people and allow them right. to buy cases, like, privately. I, I think a lot of people thought it was this, like, expensive packaging and this expensive label. You know, what they really didn't know is, you know, Justin and I went through a really vigorous process with Rob because Rob didn't want to get involved unless we really knew the process. And so there were constant trips to Napa, constant tasting, opening up every competitor's bottle of wine. What do you like? What don't you like? Blind taste testing, you know, and going through that process. Then when we knew what we liked, you know, and Rob kind of trusted my palate, which I, which I'm grateful for because he knew that I had, I had had a, you know, a, a great amount of fine wine in, in my short kind of time, in my wine experience. And so he, he knew, I knew exactly what I was looking for and he was able to kind of dial it in. And we kept going up and doing these tastings and dialing it in. And when we finally got it made, we just were really, really happy with it. The the first vintage was 2010. And I think what allowed us to have such great success so quickly was we just started tasting it with the other great wines and our wine would finish, you know, either first or second depending on the group and, and where we were. And, and it was our, it was my first project that became a business, which yeah. was really cool. And so when, by the time that we met, that's where I looked at this as like, man, okay, yeah. you created King of Clubs, like this $800 exclude, like <laughs> without any experience. So yeah. I, I began to fully understand your capabilities, right? And, and even, you know, how I describe you to this day is the relentless do or die with the mm. eagle eye mm. for the finer details, right? Because you just look like layers deeper into everything to just make it five steps higher and better than it would be where most people would just see it at step one, right? right. And so, again... We're now in this, I am have this sort of business philosophy of like, hey, like you could take your way of thinking, you as media, and mm-hmm. ultimately like really take king of clubs even to an entirely other level, right? So we decided, hey, let's build, let's, let's not 
make King of Clubs this like super exclusive? Like, are you open to try to build it to sell? Well, it? I came in for a meeting and you had tape. Remember, you had taped on the door to your office. I think Constellation bought something for 80 million or 100 million. And I yeah. walk in and there it is. And you're like, I got it. We're going to take this. You know, remember that? that <laughs> no, was no, 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 no. Yeah. I've taped it on the <laughs> Look, look, yeah. I, look, I finally had decided myself, look at this acquisition of this right. wine. Like, yeah. we need to build. Yeah. Like, I will partner with you to bring, bring kill, mm. King of Clubs to this revenue size. And to me, I just looked at like all, all that you were able to do, like, like in the exclusive bottles, if we open this up. Mm -hmm. And again, here's a running theme here. Here I am again. Like out here, you sort of have, it's about the details, the exclusivity, the experience. And I'm like, let's build it and sell it for 150 yeah. million. And, and I, I draw you in on that yeah. one, right? So we went all the way through, built out the end. That was going to be it. This is our opportunity to build a company together, get a big win. You know, we went all the way through the financials. I had my CFO consultant build the entire plan, real complex, Right. Wine. We're talking about champagne in France. And like, you know, because, of course, you ain't do, you're not going to do any <laughs> sparkling wine out of L of out of California. If you want to do champagne, we've yeah. got to go to Champagne, France. <laughs> you know, so it was like already taking me on this crazy journey. But I had, you know. Co-founded Blackfeather Whiskey, had invested in Beach Whiskey and Beatbox, right? So I, I was, I understood the complexities of how difficult the alcohol game was, mm -hmm. and I was beginning to get a little bit burned out on what that meant. And then, furthermore, when we finally got through those financials, it was like a lot of capital would be needed to be able to get to that win that would be that big exit for us, mm -hmm. and. And I just, it, and, and above all for me now, I'm, I wanted to create a company together, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like I'm investing in and helping put a big plan for King of Clubs when in reality, like I really love to create with fellow entrepreneurs and like-minded do or dyers. So I, I was getting pulled back and forth, struggling up to the edge, but sign the docs. Yeah, I think we got that far. I signed <laughs> the docs. And right. then I, I don't know what, like, I think maybe I was actually had a conversation with John Buscemi or someone about, about a, a, some sort of product that led to me just calling you and being like, would you consider creating a brand that was like, instead of the wines, like luxury products that you create, because we don't, there's no regulation. There's no, not, you take everything you put into King of Clubs and you make your entire own. And it was, I don't know if you remember the conversation specifically. I do, I do. Like, I'd love to hear. It's my your, job to remember the details. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I would love to hear your version of that yeah. moment because that yeah. was a pivotal yeah, moment you, you, in this entire uh, trajectory of both of our uh, journeys in this business. I remember thinking you were crazy. Yeah, <laughs> you're like you're the brand, and so it went from like the guy behind this brand that I built out of passion to like you're like no, you're the brand, and I remember uncomfortable like no, like this is that you have to be wrong. I remember we were in the conference room, and you kind of mapped this whole thing out. I think we we were so intense in the meeting we had drawn all over the whiteboard and started drawing on the glass table. Yeah, if you remember yeah. that, right? I have the pictures of that stuff, and you were like so passionately like you're the brand you're going to do this you're going to create something you're the founder and on the inside i'm like yes finally someone understands what i've wanted to do my whole life and on the outside i'm like you're crazy we're not doing this and you like walk you're like we're, we're doing this and you walk out for like a minute to do something and you come back and you're like i'm writing the check we're doing this i'm your partner and i'm like okay uh, what do we we and i remember you know, it was kind of this like gentleman's agreement. We didn't even have, we didn't know what we were going to call it. Yeah. We didn't know what we were going to make. It was just like, you're doing this and we're doing this and you need to figure out what we're doing. Yeah. And it's funny. You're like, I got to figure out the the name. I got, yeah. we'll figure out the name, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. are you down? And it was yeah. the, let's go make a, a luxury brand. And we really didn't, we had really, no idea what we didn't were know what do. that was yeah. or what it, what it would be. It stopped you know, the King of Clubs transaction, I had to actually like explain to him, like, I know he signed it, but yeah. we're going to go do another project. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? It's yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty heartbreaking yeah. sort of thing, but then the journey, but began. it all worked out. I mean, yeah. it, all, it all ended up working out, you know, and, and we ended up, Justin and I ended up and Rob ended up selling it. And, uh, so it all worked out. Yeah. And, and then, yeah. And so now we're on the journey and 
everything keeps leading back to your passion for the number three. Yeah. And, and like, where did this even come from? You know, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I know that my mother has sent me pictures and when I was a kid, I had some Jersey numbers that were three or it was, you know, she found a picture of me uh, with my grandfather or my great grandfather and great grandma used to come up from Florida and I'm wearing a number three Jersey, like in two different pictures. So I don't know, but it's just always been my favorite number. Like three and 33 is my favorite number. When I play golf, it's title is 33. Everything I kind of, all the signs for me, you know, lead to threes. But I remember when I texted, we, we didn't know what to call the company. And I remember when we first did uh, 2010's vintage of King of Clubs, like we didn't even know if it was a business. It was straight out of passion just to make something. So we only made 333 bottles. Like I picked that number. I like the number. It's in, um, and to me, 333 in a row was always like a big significant sign for me. Like it meant, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And so... Justin was completely down with it. And so was Rob. And so the first uh, 2010 vintage only had 333 bottles. And so I was thinking back to that. And I remember I Googled just 333 and hit, hit go and boom, up pops Roman numerals. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is so dope. Yeah. And I immediately text you and you respond with like, you know, you're like the emoji king, like, boom, like fire signs, explosive. This is it. Like, do you remember? And it was oh, like, no, I mean, as soon as I saw it and it was like with the, with the, what it, the year that it was, right. what it meant from yeah, a number, yeah, yeah. but it just looked exclusive. Then it had the backdrop connected to everything yeah. that was yeah, you yeah. as the brand. Yeah. It was like, let's go. Yeah. This is yeah. it. Yeah. You yeah. know, it was a no brainer. And, and then even, you know, we were able to buy CCCXXXIII.com. Which I still don't know how you got that. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like all these things were, yeah. were evolving into place. And then, you know, as we're ultimately figuring out how to, what are the products that we're going to even make, right? Then it, it trailed into like, how do we, you know, begin to tear this into exclusivity and what do we make? Because how many luxury products had you made up until that point? None. We're talking zero, <laughs> yeah. and it is a testament. First of all, I don't even speak Italian. Man, I, I have like, and here we are, off we go into Italy searching. And, and and look, and it's a in hindsight, I refer to it this day and age as founder market fit, yeah. where someone deciding to create a business has experience inside that particular yeah. industry or market. This would be that founder market fit, like negative, like 30, where it's like a man that just had a passion mm. for it in a relentless drive. Mm. Because really, you just found the um, Georgie who ultimately yeah. could connect you to all the world's best craftsmen in Italy. Yeah. And then you guys just went out on a journey, him being your translator and you with the vision walk like in the streets yeah. of Italy yeah. to design and create the very first line. Yeah. Like how, how was it even possible? I mean, first, I, I guess it's it's a lot of fate and destiny, right? When when you're when you when you know exactly what you want and that passion is there, that fire, that kind of really just it's a it's a it's a burning like fueled passion that just I think when you find that things just start aligning for you perfectly. And then did it did it start to feel because the energy was was building like mm. that you finally were like doing what you were meant to be doing? Well, I, I don't. See, here's the thing. And I and I recall um, when I started, you know, kind of rewriting that book, it didn't really hit me till we were going to launch. Yeah. You know, when we you know, people don't realize we spent like two years back and forth to Italy really no, this isn't good, refining, rebuilding, you know, no, this coin isn't going to work. I need something more complex. I need a closure. I need something unique. And then it's like, this guy didn't work out. This guy didn't work out. Then we finally find like, you know, 13th generation to like jeweler to the Vatican. Like, you know, this guy knows what he's doing. And so for me. But again, that's that depth of detail yeah. of how you think mm -hmm. and how it was like, no, like, give me the story. Give me yeah. the craftsmanship. Give me the depth. Yeah. Even that, like, like even how 
who ended up making the logo oh, yeah. and creating the the coin and the design. Yeah. Even that unto itself was yeah. like, no, this isn't going to be just some like normal logo. Like even like talk through even how you found the guy that did the logo. So obviously, you know, David, who I've been working with forever, anything visually that I've ever done, he's been a part of. And, and we're just really great friends. And he always kind of he, he's he's, you know, like there's a few of us that can get in each other's heads. And so we're just kind of playing around with the logo. And it's, I mean, we were sending ideas to you and it's just like, it wasn't right. And so I said, we've got to find somebody that's like going to paint this or draw. It has to be something really crazy. And so I give credit to David. He found this guy, Neil Bromley, who's like this last known medieval, like calligraphy artist who was like commissioned by the Queen of England and the Royal House of Windsor to do like all the wedding invitations. And he draws family crests and uh, I think did a coin for England. And, and so we find him and it was this like deep dive with him. Like, I want to just make something crazy. And, and so he hand painted, if you remember, we, we were, you know, he just kept drawing and drawing and I'm like, yeah. it's not good. It's not good. I yeah. mean, even he was hey, getting it's frustrated. It's so much different to be yeah. given, <laughs> given notes and needing to yeah. evolve. Like in yeah. this day and age, somebody's just doing it on a computer. They're yeah, making all these, yeah. like he literally would have to no, hand it, hand redraw, painting then send on it, yeah. like <laughs> send yeah. it in an envelope yeah. all the way back. It yeah. was, it was it a was wild crazy. process. And so when he came up with that, that gold stroke and it was like this angle and you know, there were the the diamonds and funny the Derek machine with the diamonds, right? Yeah. It was these 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 diamonds in the middle. And so, you know, the Roman numeral is 333, right? Which is the year. And so with the space, it kind of gave it like 330 and three. And it was just really cool. And and then he drew the crown. And it was like, I mean, do you remember seeing this? I have it hanging in my office in my house now. And it was like, I mean, this is, you know, it's this ancient, you know, Renaissance, you know, medieval crown. And it was, when I saw that, it was like, this is it, this is, this is, this is it, you know? And, you know, and, and look, and it, it, to that point now, now it's, you've sourced all of these great mm -hmm. uh, craftsmen and built this entire line. And, and now it's like, okay, what, what, what do we want to do with the the business model side right. of this, right? You know, everything for you is exclusivity, experience. I'm always on that other side of like, <laughs> oh, how do we, what, what can we do to like go bit, right. you know, like, right. and, and we kind of settled on, hey, let's take the 300, and 33 yeah. and and build sort of the business model behind that right, right? make like, it mean something yeah so we did the 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 one of three the yeah. one of 30 yeah. and then i couldn't i just couldn't go to the one of 300 yeah. i was like well what if we want to sell a lot yeah. and we did one of 3000 on that side right and and even then you know the one of threes were the absolute Ridiculous. like mind numbing masterpieces, right? Because the whole idea was like, how can you make like luxury goods that are functional art that will like stand the test of time and be traded as art mm -hmm. in the future, right? Like that's really yeah. like, you know, kind of my, you know, obsession with the way the Ferrari model worked and then ultimately the secondary and primary markets of art. Like I'm like, man, we could mm -hmm. end up in this like crazy yeah. world, but we also wanted it to have some sense of, at least for me, mm. accessibility, which always toiled with exclusivity mm. and experience and and the mass amount of people that could be able to buy it, right? Um, but that first gold humidor, I mean, just lay out, just just like briefly, <laughs> just even like the like that that humidor was like three hundred grand. Yeah. And it was covered, like, just explain, like, the details oh, that man. even went into yeah. it. Well, you know, I think... From a we, design standpoint. Yeah, from the design just, standpoint, we, you know, I knew that a lot of the humidors that are made out there weren't functionable and didn't really do their job correctly. So the first thing I said is we got to find something that's going to work. I don't want to just make this fancy, you know, gold and crocodile humidor and it doesn't, it's not effective, right? It doesn't really do its job. So we found this guy that had this patent on this air filtration, humification, like it was just insane. And 
he made everything out of these mahogany, uh, uh, you know, it was like this African mahogany staple. And it was like just this crazy, I want to say like scientist who figured out the components. And I said, okay, look, these are what I want to do. Can we do something this big? And I want these giant trays with like crystal glass fronts with our logo etched in them. And, and so he built the inside components and the whole patented technology. And I had this crazy idea, like, let's just make this trunk, like this trunk that would sit in your office or sit in your living room. That was this work of art to look at, to admire. And that was functional. So you could actually like, you know, it's, it's one of those things when I think you, you go to someone's house and it's, whether it's like, you know, come in my wine cellar or look at my, you know, open these two doors and everyone's proud of something that they have and they, and they love kind of that. So it was like this started off with this, like you push the button and it was this just like mechanical, you know, and it got out of hand and crazy. And I think I even mean, times like, you were like, dude, we can't spend this kind of money on making oh, this. It made no <laughs> sense. You know what uh, I mean? The first line, we're talking yeah. like double crock attache. Yeah, yeah. This thing's like 200 grand. It was caught between how do you make a great business and how do you just make the most insane yeah. pieces of art, right? And, and I think as, you know, the, the brand launched and came alive and now you were born to be the face of the brand because, I mean, you didn't skip a beat. It was like, <laughs> you know, straight into all the photo shoots, putting everything together. Like yeah, yeah. how you how you built your own personal brand behind yeah. sort of your passion and vision um, in such a short amount of time was was remarkable. And your exclusivity experience, I'm always like, man, where, where, how do we, yeah. how do we create like, you know, the different, how do we scale? Mm. Right. Like, and it was always this, this push and pull in the business model. And I think early on, because there's also a lot of headwinds as someone launching into luxury, right? Mm. Like you have to build a resume over time in luxury. And to me, I felt like, your passion, mm. the attention to detail, the depth of what you were actually putting into every single design would speak louder than the legacy that's traditionally used for luxury goods, mm. right? And we hit headwinds in that, right? Mm. Because it's like you have to prove yourself over a much longer period of time. Mm. You know, you yeah. just showed up, spend some time here. Let's yeah. see how long you last type yeah. of vibe, right? Yeah. And so that gave, you know... As your partner now, I'm, I'm, you know, what are we doing? We're struggling here, like yeah. in the sense of like, okay, let's, let's explore opening it up a little bit, you know, because there is a younger generation of people that also are looking for sort of a new luxury and, and really your personal brand basically evolved into like everything's going sort of the streetwear way in luxury. I, like I'm like a gentleman, like my, like, how do we, how do I be just a beacon for what it means to be mm -hmm. a gentleman, you know, which was another cornerstone of the evolution of, mm -hmm. of you as a personal brand. But by me and, and you, you know, really, I feel like I was always putting pressure on like, mm -hmm. well, you know, how can we, how can we open <laughs> it up a little bit? Yeah. It was, it was against your sort of core value and really your vision for what luxury is, mm -hmm. but you went along with it on, with me, right? Right. As business partners and let's be smart. And at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I still think that it, it pulled away from what made the functional art aspect of it and the experience and the exclusivity uh, of it. And, and, and I, in hindsight, we know that like, Hey, like that's not like what, you were meant to do with your creative abilities and ultimately the stuff that you can create. But at that time, um, you know, what was the pull for you when it was like, okay, let's make, uh, let's make a, a, a less expensive backpack and, and a toiletry. Like what was your mind and, and sort of as developing that stuff? Well, look, I think, you know, again, it was my first time being the brand and being like the center of attention. And so I, it was unfamiliar to me. So I was trusting you. So even though it was kind of like, ah, I really don't want to make it cheaper. I want to make it more expensive. It's, um, I want to make better quality zippers. I want to have, you know, better materials. And, um, you know, these coins that we make are really expensive and they're all hand done still in Florence. Like it's, nobody would still do the process. I mean, I, I, I kind of, you know, share with people that the, 
we spend probably more money on those three coins than most uh, luxury brands would spend on the entire product. Yeah. Right? It's just, this is true. That's a fact actually. And, and what makes it special? Yeah. And it's the store. I think here's the thing for me. It's like, if you go in and you, and you purchase something as a consumer and it's like, you know, here's this expensive product and you get it and it, and it is what it is. Right. To me, I always was excited. And I think that's where my passion spoke to you early on in our relationship was I loved the, the, the story, like even on certain watch brands where like these two passionate guys and watches came together and wanted to like push the limits and the boundaries of making something that to me, it was the story that I think was always powerful for me. And by making something, you know, quicker or doing something more manufactured instead of this deep story of this passionate, you know, jeweler in Florence, who's like doing it the old fashioned way, doesn't make it to me as cool. doesn't make it to me as fascinating. And, and I don't think it makes it as special. So it was this kind of pull, you know, where I didn't really want to go that route. Yeah. And look, and where it really changed, um, I think once and for all mm -hmm. to evolve into what it is today, um, was, um, uh, the orange ostrich purse for Beyonce. <laughs> yeah. Right. And the purple um, backpack for Justin Bieber. Yeah, right. I, yeah. I think like when these, you know, they're like these one of one like hero pieces mm -hmm. for like, you know, these cultural icons, mm -hmm. like it, it, it re like committed to the concept of like, man, this is, this is what should never be like a mass, like this shouldn't go yeah. to retail and what it is like, this really is ultimately like build the entire story and, and do it. Um, it, it just became a much more clear. And then I think for us, even the business model, right? Because right. like, no, I shouldn't be like pushing and pulling as like, uh, you know, like a, a experience story exclusivity mm. and then like, oh, like business and, and let's, let's think about retail and what's this yeah. and that, like those were pulling against yeah. each other. And when they finally like, <laughs> no, like it's actually, this is both, this is your yeah. core values yeah. of who you are, right? Yeah. It is actually what makes this functional art and these extraordinary pieces, mm -hmm. Um, so unique and special. And then the, 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 the customers and the people that actually love like going through the process of creating mm. with you want that exclusivity and that sort of, you it know, makes it unique special. experience and make it special. I think it, it took a long time for me now yeah. to like circle back to like align to where we are today and what the business is. You know? I remember that meeting we had, you're like, um, we need to go to retail. And I'm like, no, 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 no retail. No, I don't, I don't want to go into retail. Well, we need to get into, you know, these department stores. And I'm like, no, that's, that's not what I want to do. That's not luxury. That's not what I, you know, yeah, we were, Hey, we were always, yeah. and you know, the problem is, is as good of friends we are. And as, you know, um, as, as well as we know each other, it's still the, yeah. I'm going to, you know, yeah. You know, I'm in a Zara jacket for like forty nine dollars, <laughs> and you're right. in like a ten thousand dollar custom suit. I don't really know yeah, luxury, yeah, right? Yeah. And and that for me is another. But you know, you know business, brother. Yeah, like and, you're really smart but, in that. In that and that. And no, without a doubt. But I was still, you know, what I really learned is us as partners too. Is like, hey, like you know, like validate your ideas, like rather than assume your ideas are the right ideas, right? Because when I, I still am always like looking at like how it stacks up into this big payout versus like even how to do it the right way from an authenticity standpoint to create that long game that does right. create that great luxury. But, you know, again, I'm, the journey is as the destiny was mm. that that slight twist and turn that even brought us together mm. to then ultimately go on to create this brand together and and go on the journey because now uh it truly is the exactly the business with the right business model um the way it was meant to be from the very beginning you know so um 
I know you, you know, look, and, you know, even it's even more fun to me, for me because now we're cre- we're creating this crazy bespoke yeah. collection yeah. Uh, for me. Um, I don't even know if you can speak to some of the clientele you got cooking right now, but, you know, you did just do the craziest one of one, like purple ostrich golf bag, yeah. like, you know, um, you know, I don't know. Can you even speak to? Yeah, uh, I mean, look, I think, well, you know, going back one step, we knew that the three coins were significant. I remember that conversation and we both agreed with that. And then, you know, by having them be so unique and so special, I wanted the brand to be unique and special. And it's kind of hard to do both sides. And when I created the golf bag, the the purple ostrich bag, you know, that to me was, I think the happiest I've been creating something because I took an idea that a client had and wanted to do and was able to bring it to life, you know, and, and I think so many people and friends always say, you know, Chris takes something and makes it better. Right. And what does that mean? And so the ability to have this kind of deep passion where like, you know, the, 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 there's a jewelry pocket lined in shave mink for this guy's watches and rings when he's golfing and, you know, just the layers of, of, of depth and detail. Um, and it's, it became really in, in hearing you say it kind of out loud together, cause we obviously, you know, because of, of, of the situation with, uh, where we've been in, 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 in America the, the past year, we haven't had these, you know, we used to have these intense energy, great meetings like once a month. Yeah. And so, you know, it's literally evolved almost kind of on its own to exactly what the vision was from the very beginning. Hundred percent. Like, like it's crazy. Like, hey, and hey, and, and and let me let me let me kind of like <laughs> say this as as sort of the 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 button on this journey. At, at it has come three sixty mm. to exactly what it was supposed to be in the very mm. beginning, and now for me, I know that this is now going to be your mastery Mm -hmm. and the, and that these first few years were the foundation of the next 50 years, right? Like that's the, that's what's actually so beautiful about it now is that it has really laid the foundation Mm -hmm. that's going to allow it to evolve into one of the greatest luxury brands ever Mm -hmm. created Mm -hmm. all (laughs) <laughs> All within a slice of destiny oh, of man. pulling down, and yeah. here we are. Yeah. Get to talk about it now yeah. in this penthouse. Yeah. So look, uh, it's been an amazing journey. Love you to death. Man. You know what Same I mean? Here, it's, it's. I'm glad that um, it has gone the way it's gone. It's been been an absolutely amazing ride and, yeah. and unbelievable. You are the truest and realest do or die of them all. <laughs> um, and I look forward to to continuing yeah. episodes of yeah. the evolution of the Great Three Thirty Three. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of the Build with uh, Rob show. Uh, appreciate you having me. Good to see you, brother. Be good. All right, if you think you have what it takes to be a do or die or and partner with me and build an amazing company, or if you want to join our growing community of machinists and be the first to test out our new products and help us manufacture amazing, go to DeerDeckMachine.com. If you haven't listened to the DeerDeck Machine Primer, I encourage you to go back to episode one, which gives you insights to our machine method and really will enhance your experience to listening to the rest of the episodes. Make sure you subscribe to Build With Rob wherever you join us, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and anywhere else you get your podcasts and videos from. And most importantly, make sure you got a vision, make sure you got a plan, and make sure you got the wherewithal to push it forward. See it, believe it, do it. We'll see you next time on Build With Rob.